you can't publish. Uh, I think this is not only unfortunate for the author, it's unfortunate for the country and the world as a whole because this is a problem we had better get straight so we know what to do. Finally, I think after more than a year of, of waiting, we got the paper published in the Royal Society. At the end of this journey, I can now say with great confidence, yes, we have found a very beautiful solution to the cloud measure. And what remains a mystery is when the rest of the climate community will understand that far greater powers are controlling the climate from the outside. The sun affects climate here on Earth. The Milky Way affects climate here on Earth. And if you want to understand what's going on, we have to take uh, these factors into account. It's beautiful because uh, instead of us living here in this uh, isolated planet, we are part of this uh, galactic ecosystem. We're witnessing what's going on uh, around us. These ideas are showing that the Earth is no longer just an isolated little island floating around in the universe. We are part of the big universe and the processes that are going on there, like star formation on the long time scales, uh, or changes in the solar activity, will all affect the Earth's climate. And it can have very large changes in the Earth's climate because of this. Why is the grass green? Why is the 
why is the sky blue? Science is really the uh, knowledge evolving through the collection of scientific data, scientific research. We evolve our knowledge. Why does one tree break faster than another? You know, uh, you know, why do they use titanium rods in your leg if you have an injury rather than steel? I mean, it's basically a study of all the, the you know, the materials that we have on the planet. But it goes beyond that. Of course, you know, we study uh, outer space and things like that. And this comes from the collection of research from many entities. And then, so you collect this data, and then you have to present it uh, not in the court of uh, public opinion. You have to present the court of scientific inquiry, and it becomes accepted. Science is part methodology in that we have, for a very long period of time, had this data-based approach to verifying a principle. You form a hypothesis, then you go out and test it. If you can't test a hypothesis, it's not science. For example, EPA statement that most of the warming since 1950 is caused by greenhouse gases, that's a testable hypothesis. The data come from the test comes back and verifies what you thought, then your hypothesis has validity. But when somebody comes along and starts challenging the status quo that says that, uh, oh, the, the sun, the oceans, the uh, continents moving apart, that these have factors on, on temperature. When somebody comes along and has a uh, another theory, uh, and he wants to propose that, if we said that both warming and cooling and snowstorms and lack of snowstorms and lots of hurricanes and no hurricanes are all caused by global warming, nothing is testable. It's like Marxism. It's, it's a pseudoscience, not a real science. Like now, say, well, human beings are the ones that's really having a big, fact, big effect on this temperature. And typically, the scientific method says he would have to gather his scientific evidence, and he would have to be able to present that and leave it challengeable. Science always has to be challenged one way or another, because eventually, if it's true, good science and it becomes a law or uh, accepted theory, others will be able to repeat the same kind of uh, information. Science is a system of validating predictions and calculations through the use of the scientific method. The process by which a hypothesis is formed then is tested to see if it stands up to standards in experimentation and an ultimate search for scientific truths. We see exactly the opposite now here. We've got the uh, alarmists acting as if they are the accepted science and defines those of us that are skeptical as deniers. Extremely dangerous questions. Because with our present knowledge, we have no idea what would happen. Even now, man may be unwittingly changing the world's climate through the waste products of his civilization. Due to our release through factories and automobiles every year of more than six billion tons of carbon dioxide, which helps air absorb heat from the sun, our atmosphere seems to be getting warmer. This is bad. Well, it's been calculated a few degrees rise in the Earth's temperature would melt the polar ice caps. And if this happens, an inland sea would fill a good portion of the Mississippi Valley. Tourists in glass-bottomed boats would be viewing the ground towers of Miami through 150 feet Current of tropical water. Foreign weather, we're not only dealing with forces of a far greater variety than even the atomic physicist encounters, wow, but with life itself. And we're supposed to prove that a non-accepted scientific position anthropogenic global warming is the accepted truth, and it's not. Short-sighted educated guesses that do not survive this trial process of rigorous observation from any and all skeptics are taken as only a hypothesis. They should never be used by political bodies to restrict and regulate personal actions. By capping productivity and trading economic prosperity for environmental concerns, we run the risk of losing our way of life.
The global warming hypothesis needs more observation. There's been a fundamental change in the debate uh, in public perception as well as the uh, scholarly research on this topic. What causes it, what the extent has been, what the consequences are, and whether or not it makes sense to try to do anything about it. The purpose of this event is to learn the truth about climate change. As the shepherd boy became bored, he decided to say, what kind of tricks can a boy like me play? The world will surely believe me if there, I cry out wolf, dressed as a polar bear. One of the poster children for global warming is of course polar bear. Let's break the ice by observing the polar bear who has become the unofficial mascot of the modern global warming movement. I mean, one of the silliest things that's going on right now is about the polar bears, okay? All those cuddly polar bears are so sweet, and therefore humankind's effect on global warming is a terrible thing. Now that, of course, is the argument of ad misericordia, the argument from pity, the pity fallacy. Just because you feel sorry for the polar bears doesn't mean that we have anything to do with global warming or that the polar bears would suffer in any way if it did get We know, after all, that for most of the last 11,400 years it was warmer than today, and if you go back 125,000 years to the last interglacial period, which only lasted half as long as this one, the temperatures rose to 5 Celsius degrees above today's. There was probably no ice in the Arctic at all, but the polar bears did just fine. They moved onto the land just as they do now. In the summer, when there's not much ice in the Arctic, it's not a problem for them. Well, the polar bears have made it through all the global warming cycles during the past millions of years. As I stated, we've had 2,200 global warmings in the past uh, half million years. We've had five mega global warmings like we're in now. They've made it through all of them. And actually, we have more polar bears now than we did back 30 years ago. You know, recently in the, uh, they tried to have a, uh, a global thing to get a lot of countries to make polar bears, you know, uh, to be uh, endangered, which the United States has said they're endangered. The issue of whether or not a species is put on the endangered species list is a decision made by either NOAA or the Fish and Wildlife Service, and the Fish and Wildlife Service under the Bush administration listed the polar bear, and Alaska thinks that's incorrect. So that's a, a big battle in Washington, D.C. right now in federal court. Well, it turns out the two countries that most of the polar bears are Canada and Russia. They refuse to sign on them. Why not? Well, it turns out that in Canada, which I know best, is the number of polar bears are at least double what they were 50 years ago. They're all controlled. The Inuits or Eskimos up there are allowed to take what they need for sustainability, and the polar bears are in great shape, right? Not according to former Vice President Al Gore, who claimed global warming was leading to the extinction of the polar bear. And what Al Gore said was that polar bears were threatened because they were going to have to swim 60 miles to find the ass because the ass was becoming short in the act. I had a look at the paper that he was citing at Monitor Peace in 2006. He presumably got an advanced coffee with while he was making the film. And what that paper said was that four polar bears had died because there'd been a big storm and they'd been swamped by high winds and high waves. As we scientists put it, shit happens. Nothing whatever to do with global warming. And the judge was very angry about that because the paper was so clear. We just put the paper in front of the judge. Here's the paper, this is what it says. Here are the, we actually were able to show where the four polar bears died because it was, they were, there was an overflight of the, of the um, Beaufort Sea by the USAF aircraft taking pictures. And they were able to show exactly where the four and it appeared in the paper. Um, and I then did some extra checking and I found that in the Beaufort Sea over the last 30 years there has been no loss of sea ice at all. If anything, it's very, very slightly increased. So at no point was there any basis in truth or reality for what Al Gore was saying. And once again, there he must have been lying because he was citing a paper that at no point said that global warming was responsible for any of this. He just made it up. But overall, polar bear populations are seem pretty stable from the numbers I've seen. Again, just the raw data, the observations, the bear accounts. So the idea that somehow the polar bears are threatened has no basis in reality.
And this is why everyone is so worried about global warming. What might be causing this? Carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide in the atmosphere actually blocks radiation from getting out away from the Earth, and it traps it inside the envelope of the Earth, making it warmer and warmer. So for years and years and years, it could have a major impact on our climate. The advocates of global warming claim that the effects of human actions are increasing temperatures at catastrophic rates, ultimately affecting Earth's life forms. The polar bear represents the canary in a coal mine. By studying the population, the world should be able to see a decrease in bear numbers. Thus, using these numbers as a first alert system for global warming's destructive nature. If the example of the polar bear has been misrepresented, what other claims are inaccurate? Or even worse, have similar climate scares happened before under the guise of a different name? Thank you, Senator. Senator Brasso? Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chairman. Uh, well, Administrator Jackson, uh, in an article today in uh, Politico uh, entitled, Does Industry Cry Wolf on Regs? Uh, you are quoted as saying, uh, today's forecasts of economic doom are nearly identical, almost word for word, to the doomsday predictions of the last 40 years, with a picture of you today in Politico. It goes on, you're quoted as saying, this broken record continues despite the fact that history has proven the doomsayers wrong again and again. I just want to explore that statement, uh, Administrator Jackson. Uh, Forty years ago, uh, and you talked about 40 years ago, the same scientists uh, that are predicting the end of the world now from global warming uh, were predicting the end of the world from global cooling. I have with me a number of articles that I collected when I was in college, Newsweek magazine, The Cooling World, uh, New York Times, a major cooling widely considered to be inevitable. Uh, one from Time Magazine, another ice age. Oh, goodness, we've been dealing with this issue since the 1970s in terms of, you know, is the climate getting colder, is the climate getting warmer? Back then, the big scare was, hey, we're going to go into the next ice age. Perhaps global cooling? Now it's, yeah, global warming. And you notice that over the last two years, it's changed from global warming to climate change. Back in 1975, a Newsweek article entitled The Cooling World stated that weather patterns have begun to change dramatically, dropping a half of a degree, and assured that the evidence in support of these predictions has now begun to accumulate so massively that meteorologists are hard-pressed to keep up with it. Inevitably, no ice age came as real-world observations didn't match the frigid predictions of the global cooling hypothesis. The fact is that the same doomsday predictions from 40 years ago uh, is all we are getting from this agency and this administration today. Only now the problem that the administration claims is man-made global warming. Not natural global warming, not mostly natural global warming, not, we're not quite sure to what extent it is man-made. Nope, it's all man's fault. The administration believes that the greatest environmental threat faced by man is ourselves, our past economic progress, and this administration intends to issue the greatest pile of regulations in the history of the Environmental Protection Agency and perhaps the United States to combat that threat. Forty years later, we are now told to be increasingly worried of the opposite situation. The public is now warned to begin preparing for a drastic heating age. Should today's doom and gloom predictions for our future be any more credible than those of the past? Steep downgrade ahead. The villagers became wiser to the shepherd boy's roots. His tales became fables written by Aesop or Goose. With wolf to warming, the boy began hanging his noose. Continued observations are necessary to begin to understand the global warming debate. In searching for observations, we must look further than the polar bear. Much further. To objectively analyze global warming, we must first probe into space to determine if the warming is uniquely terrestrial, or if it is, in fact, interplanetary.
mission on another planetary body. In placing his mark on the moon, mankind had collectively looked up into the cosmos. around the, uh, the, the Milky Way. All of these are cyclic kind of motions and they have an impact on our temperature, on the distance that we are from uh, various places. For example, the dominant factor should be obvious to everybody is the sun. Surprise, surprise. The Earth climate system warming or cooling could be controlled by the sun? I'm so surprised. Yeah, we're sitting here worrying ourselves sick about our planet, the Earth, and uh, whether the car we're driving is putting out too much carbon dioxide, um, there are other planets in the solar system. They don't have cars. They don't, don't have to worry about it. Some of them are very heavy in carbon dioxide. Some of them are not. Their temperature is changing, uh, and they're changing because there are much in larger factors than what humans are emitting in the way of carbon dioxide. Each planet has a distinct climate system that is independently regulated by these larger factors. Some of these factors can only affect the respective planet individually. However, other factors can influence multiple climate systems at once. If characteristics of Earth's warming are indeed man-made, then there should be no evidence of warming on other planets in our solar system. To define the idea that the sun could affect the Earth climate system and weather, which is actually what the area of my expertise, I can say a few more later. Then one ought to be able to find the effects happen to other planets. The data, I would say, is reasonably good in the sense that uh, we have enough information. For example, Mars okay, used to have some kind of a CO2 ice cap. CO2, actually, this ice is actually frozen dry CO2. Okay. But this dry CO2 ice cap actually has been slowly receding, at least from pictures that we can take, you know. Let's say in 76 when we have a satellite Vikings went there, right? We have that kind of thing, comparison. This is about 1954, I believe. I mean, this is my uh, 56th year of observing Mars. Over the years, Dr. Parker came to specialize in the solar system research and planetary photography. Dr. Parker has been searching for trends from the vantage point of a telescope for over half a century, meticulously documenting over 20,000 images of Mars in the night sky. So my first set of observations was in the 1979 Mars apparition. And I found from all the measurements that, that uh, I did that Mars' polar cap was uh, quite a bit smaller than, than previous apparitions. Um, so for the next several years, uh, in a half I and uh, take my the partner Jeff Gish, who's another I Mars amateur, Speed uh, did probably 10,000 micrometer measurements of, of Mars, each uh, Mars apparition, mostly of the North Polar Cap. And Speed we uh, compared these with, with observations that have been made by Chick Capon during the 60s and 70s. Uh, we also had the opportunity many times to go to Flagstaff, Arizona and use the big level refractor with the same instruments that uh, Chick and his colleagues had used to measure the polar caps and also with, with them with us. So uh, in this regard, we felt that these observations overlap or had good quality, that uh, we hadn't really done anything different. So uh, the net result was that the 60s, the cap was larger than the 80s, and in the 80s it was larger than the 90s. And we said, gee whiz, there's global warming on Mars. And this is before the term global warming was ever known. We just thought that was kind of neat. Well, there has been evidence that Mars and other planetary bodies in the solar system has been warming. They have been warming in many regards similar to the way the Earth has been warming. That would seem to suggest that uh, the theory of many scientists that most of the warming here on Earth over recent decades has been caused by solar influences. But this would seem to, to back up to support those, uh, those scientific assertions. Uh, we did 
see a warming on Mars. Now, since that time, the Mars Global Surveyor spacecraft has been circling Mars. I believe it just shut down, shut down here a year or so ago. And the astronomers there did look at the polar cap regression, and they found that, yes, uh, uh, in the late 1990s, each Martian year, the cap was smaller uh, on exactly the same Martian date. And one of the chief scientists uh, said that Mars seems to be undergoing global warming. Really, we need to know a lot more about Mars and other planetary bodies know exactly what's causing. There could be other, other uh, causes, but it's another piece of evidence that indicates, hey, this may not be such a slam dunk case for carbon dioxide here on Earth being the primary driver of recent temperature increase because we're seeing it elsewhere where we don't have any Martians driving SUVs. Uh, we don't have any coal-fired power plants polluting the Martian atmosphere and yet temperatures are rising. There are some professional astronomers who have been studying this and studying other planets as well. Uh, Saturn appears to have warmed up. Uh, somewhat uh, occultation miles. data, which means that a planet goes in front of a star and they can measure the fading of the star as it goes through the planet's atmosphere as its light goes through the atmosphere. That uh, show that Pluto may have warmed up. Uh, Triton, which is Neptune's largest moon, has undergone some warming. A friend of mine from uh, the Lowe Observatory in Arizona, southern Arizona, has been actually monitoring the certain aspect of the emission from the Neptune planets. Yeah, we're able to see actually modulation by something uh, related to what the sun is doing, basically. Up and down, up and down in that sense. A lot of this data, well, it, it does show that there may be some uh, variations in the solar system environment. Uh, a lot of it is based on one or two observations. We just don't have the, the historical data available for a lot of these outer planet claims. I think what this does point out is that, number one, Scientists are looking at, at uh, temperature variations, or I should say climate variations. And number two, this points out that even on so-called dead worlds, things are changing all the time. We, we have a climate environment that's changing constantly in, in our solar system, and when you get right down to it, all throughout the galaxy. Up and down, warming then cooling, again and again. The cyclical behavior of larger climate factors all serve to regulate and maintain a planet's climate at near homeostasis or equilibrium. This occurs over thousands of years, and even just over several hours. These larger factors, by working together and against one another, influence our planet, Earth's climate system. To begin understanding the variety of forces on our climate system, let's evaluate several examples by studying the scope of their influences. The sun. Although the data are not as clear as we want, we wish to, but I think the, the idea to try to entertain that the sun could affect the Earth climate system is a very sound one. One should pursue and study it, rather than to try to dismiss it. That's the way the attitude is. Earth's orbit. the elliptical nature of the sun's orbit around, and, uh, the Earth's orbit around the sun, the tilt of the Earth's orbit changes, and it actually even wobbles. And we know that those have uh, impacts on the climate of the Earth, since Milankovitch did the work in uh, well, the early part of uh, the last century. The moon. There are very specific cycles of the moon, gravitational cycles, that cause an increase in gravitational tug on the Earth. 47%. That's a fantastic amount. And if you look at these cycles over four-year cycles caused El Nino's by tugging at the oceans, then you have your 230-year uh, cycles that cause the global warming cycles every 230 years. The water cycle. When the Earth heats up 0.2 degrees, it warms up the oceans, more evaporation of water vapor from the oceans. So you put more of this water vapor in the atmosphere, another greenhouse gas, which then can double or triple or even more magnify the effect of the carbon dioxide, cause more warming. The problem comes in, water vapor gets in the atmosphere, eventually it condenses in the clouds and falls out as rain. 
But once it's clouds, it's now reflecting sunlight. That action will cool the Earth. So which effect is greater? Natural disasters. The, the sun put the heat in unevenly, and the hurricanes is nature's way to redistribute the heat. Okay? And it's an efficient way. Okay? And so wimpy winds ain't going to do it. So it's got to be a really strong energetic system. Carbon-based life forms, specifically the human species. One However, to the humans' right biggest I contribution to south. climate change is debatable. Anthropogenic greenhouse gases are the popular choice of the day. But the changing of land from human use may be just as responsible. Land change. I hate to sound like Bill Clinton, but that depends on what you mean by influence and what the influence is. Uh, if we say greenhouse gases, greenhouse gas emissions, I suspect that less than half of the late 20th century warming, or the warming since 1950, is a result of greenhouse gas emissions. But there are other human components that affect the climate system. We change the surface of the In land. We turn, turn a forest I into a farm. South. We turn a farm into a city. We you know, we've dramatically but changed all the landscape derecha. of much of North America, for example. And that has influence on the climate. Roger, Roger Pilkey Sr. out at Colorado, the University of Colorado south. believes that the influence of land use change is as large as the influence of greenhouse gases. Greenhouse gases. The infamous greenhouse gases led by CO2. Yet, CO2 is not even crowned with the title of the most potent greenhouse gas. That distinction goes to water vapor. That's right. H2O, not CO2. Water vapor. Water vapor gets more than 3% in our atmosphere compared to the 0.03% amount of CO2 in our atmosphere. It's a hundredfold more. And water is a much more powerful absorber of the infrared light that is, is um, what we are talking about, the heat component. Carbon dioxide. If the polar bear has become the mascot of the global warming debate, then CO2 has been cast as the lead villain. The proponents of global warming have taken the issue and boiled it down to a molecular level. They argue that man-made increases in CO2 single-handedly has the effect of increasing Earth's temperature catastrophically. This seems short-sighted to single out man-made CO2 while disregarding all other factors. In fact, focusing and perpetuating this narrow-minded hypothesis makes it easy to miss the forest for the trees, overlooking the bigger picture. CO2 is essential to all life on our planet. Still, the question remains, how important is carbon dioxide to the Earth? Why would the boy make up such a tale when, given the facts, villagers knew it would fail? Carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere, first of all, it's a trace element, a trace gas. Uh, it's about, uh, if you look at a, a football stadium with uh, 100,000 people in it, each person representing a molecule in the atmosphere, I think, carbon dioxide would be about 35 or 36 people. And the human contribution to that may be that little guy with a red hat down there in row three. I mean, it's just, it's minuscule. And even if we double the carbon dioxide, then we got two little guys in red hats among 100,000 people. So, uh, you know, I, I just feel that uh, we're, we're being arrogant in, in the fact that we're you know, controlling the climate. Now, this amount of CO2, somebody might say, oh, well, it may be so very small, but it is so powerful. Well, in fact, is it so powerful? The 
the levels that we see today are quite similar to what we had every 116,000 years. It's a natural cycle, it's a natural feedback from the oceans and the land mass to reintroduce carbon dioxide back in the